Hello everyone and welcome back to this week's vlog update. So I thought that we're not quite done with talking about Wanderlust because really I just showed you a car and I showed you Whistler, kind of, and maybe a restaurant. So I shot so much footage and there's just so much that has going on, that was going on at Wanderlust at these different events. And while I couldn't really bring my camera to each of them, because in all fairness, even if I did, I don't think that you would have had the same experience as I have. So I don't think it really would have served you. But what I did do is I did show up with my camera and I brought it along to just kind of showcase who is actually there. So I thought that in today's episode, we would just take a few minutes to highlight some of the brilliant people that I had a chance to meet and to soak up their wisdom. So maybe you will look into it and maybe it will open up your mind to just looking at the world through a different lens, you know, because that's what we're really all about here. So first, I want you to meet Nadia Bolsweber, who is a brilliant, brilliant pastor. She talked very strongly about shame and about duality and what that really means and how we have dualistic thinking in a lot of ways. We're either black or white or we're religious or we're atheist. And and the more I said, while I'm personally not religious, I definitely have and obviously with yoga and going to yoga and meditation type of festivals and I'm very drawn into that world. I have a huge appreciation for different religious practices. I think they're very sacred, but I think that just like with anything, if it's being misused, then it can really go down into a dark path of a dark alley that most of us really don't want to go down on. And while I never really had a chance to, I never really thought about it that way in the past until she sort of brought it up. I definitely felt parts of what she was mentioning in other areas of my life, like how we can use food and eating styles as a way of really create division. And I felt that very strongly because sometimes certain people might have a certain eating style and they might think that that gives them, that puts them on a certain pedestal where they can sort of look upon, look down upon everyone else and use it as a form of judgment or use that as ammo to really be righteous, which I personally don't agree with. I think that with all the knowledge that we have access to, it needs to be used in a positive way where we're really influencing positive change and we're really educating and empowering others so if you never got that from me well then there you have it but she really mentioned so much about shame and about how we're using religion in specifically as a tool to really place ourselves in a pedestal and really use shame which is such a strong emotional state to really belittle the rest of, to belittle others and how we can kind of get away from that so while I didn't really know much about her prior to really going and seeing this talk because I didn't really know what to expect, when I did, I recorded the entire talk and I'm so glad that I did. So I will show you a couple of snippets of her talk so you can kind of get a gist of it. I will do my best to sort of slow down the camera movement because I'm using the large camera that I'm using right now. And honestly, with not having my tripod, not having anything to stabilize it, it was sort of a nightmare to record anything and make it stable and zoomed in. So please forgive the quality, but the the message is definitely there. So go ahead and take a look. Really intense fundamentalist Christian upbringing that, um, that gave me really dualistic thinking. I mean, it, it, everything was good or bad, us or them, you're in or you're out, you're saved or you're lost. Actually, one of the things I wanted to talk about today is that word salvation, which was, when I was growing up meant like um, if you were really good and didn't do anything fun or pleasurable while alive on earth, your reward is you can enjoy yourself in heaven. And then, um, and then the people who did have, do fun and enjoyable and pleasurable things in life here on earth uh, spent eternity burning in, in uh, torment, in a fire of burning lava. And that, that always seemed more like a human thing than something I could reconcile with a loving God, the idea that people would be burning uh, in eternal torment. It gave me really 
dualistic thinking. And you can take the girl out of fundamentalism, but it's harder to take the fundamentalism out of the girl. And so even when I left that church when I was like 17 years old, I didn't um, leave behind the type of thinking they gave me. I just replaced it with like super leftist politics and activism. And so it, the, the mental construct I was using to understand myself and the world and other people was almost exactly the same because you were either good or you were bad. You either had the right ideology or you were wrong. You were either us or you were, you know, them. And so I, um, I didn't feel free from that upbringing for um, a long time until I realized um, the point where I felt kind of free from it was when, interestingly, when I was able to look back on my religious upbringing and not view it dualistically, if that makes sense, when I could look back on it and admit to myself that there were beautiful things about it, there were good things about it that I cherish, and admitting that didn't feel like it was a betrayal of the part of me that was hurt by the shitty stuff. The thing about that word salvation, though, is that the root word in Greek is sozo, and that actually means wholeness and healing. I've been thinking about what does wholeness and healing mean in the context of like the wellness community, because I'm somebody who um, is a yogi, does yoga, and is um, a theologian at the same time. And so I, I kind of realized there's a lot in the yoga community that the church could learn, and there's a lot in the church that the yoga community could learn, and yet neither are in conversation with each other because they're, they're mutually suspicious of each other. And for reasons I completely understand, I'm not dismissing that. I think often in yoga, um, I long I long for something other than just affirmation from the teachers because while affirmation's not unimportant, I don't find it as transformative as what would feel to me to be the whole truth of who we are. Like I, part of me wants at the beginning of yoga class for my teacher to say instead of just a con constant message of affirmation and self-care to say like what if we all just spent this hour thinking who we might owe an apology to that whole aversion that we have to feeling bad might originate from really shameful messages that so many of us receive through religion what's going on in actual people's lives what's actually happening in our bodies and in our hearts and what are our struggles and what are our pain? What's our suffering? What's our joy? What do we need, desperately need freedom from? Wasn't that powerful? I know I sure felt it so strongly. And like I said, I, I wasn't brought up in a religious upbringing, but yet still like just understanding and learning more about religion, it just sort of opens my eyes about not just you know, the need for a spiritual practice and a need for spirituality, but also how we can sort of keep our eyes open and be a bit more empowered and where we can really truly find our tribe. That was another thing that I found that was really interesting within her talk is towards the end, she opened up the stage for, for Q&A and so many of the, the women that were in that audience were basically expressing their yearning and their hunger for a sense of belonging and community where they're judgment free, where they can they can take the time and create that space and really figure out where they're at with this whole spirituality, religion concept of, you know, because that, that will that will apply to so many different areas of your life, like how you parent, how you show up as a human, how you show up as a partner, as a business owner, if you run a business as an employee. All of these things, they're like fundamental concepts of life. And the fact that I see this yearning of just a sense of belonging, it just makes me feel not so alone because that has been one of my biggest pain points over the years as well. Okay, next up, I really wanted you to meet Julian Brass. Julian Brass was not a keynote speaker. However, I really wanted to just highlight him just for a moment. He has written a book called Own Your Anxiety, 
which is basically being released in about two to three weeks. So it's coming out as of mid-September. I will just leave the link down in the description so you can take a look at him. But we were walking by his booth so often and I had no idea that he has actually seen some of my work, which is not much, but he has seen some of my work on Instagram and primarily he's found on Instagram. So of course he would probably not really know too much about what I am all about. But nevertheless, he's close by, he lives in Toronto he is absolutely amazing I think that once you see the footage of him you're going to absolutely fall in love with him he's been struggling with anxiety for quite a few years he's gone on this massive massive um, spiritual journey to really uncover and untangle really what's going on and what what is this anxiety coming from and how we can live in a more holistic more balanced life when we're not constantly owned by our stressors and our own internal imbalances so I'm going to insert a little clip so you get a chance to meet him. He can tell you a little bit about the inspiration behind why he wrote the book, which I thought was absolutely amazing. I always inspire people that will take the time to really put in the work within themselves and then also to translate a lot of that work so that it can start healing others as well. While I absolutely love Wanderlust, and I think most of you already know this, but I think I actually mentioned this in the clip with him as well, that I always sort of just feel like it's still designed for the elite. It's still designed for people that have the means and the funds and the time to actually get away and to sign up for all of these experiences. And I mentioned this in my original Wanderlust video, and I still stand behind that, that I think whoever goes to Wanderlust, you will have an absolutely spectacular experience. But that does not mean that that's the only place that you can get help. So when I see influencers are taking the time and actually creating tangible, tangible tools that you can use right now without having to travel to BC, without having to travel to California and spend the time and away from your family or spend the time away from your work and invest that time and invest that money into being, being immersed in that environment. If that's not in the cards for you, there's still help, there's still hope, there's still resources everywhere that you can use. I think it always just starts with the having the mindset that you are open to, you know, make some changes and that the way that you're feeling today, it's it's very temporary. So here's a clip, let's meet Julian Brass. My what? Are you on YouTube? Or where are you? Mostly Instagram. Mostly, oh, we need to get you on YouTube. I know. You're gonna be on YouTube. All right, hey. Hope it's okay. What's up? What's up? What's up? How are you guys doing? So, so can you tell me a little bit about your uh, He's also retreat? becoming a little YouTuber because I'm training him. I actually do have a what channel. Brant Brantford? Yeah, Brantford. You mentioned it's Camp Soul. Okay. And it is a weekend to get away from the city, get away from wherever home is for you, and really get away from it all while retreating to yourself. So when is it? September 28th to 30th. Okay. So we need to find it. Uh, this is actually the first time doing it. Oh. First time, yeah. And it will be the first time I've, I've led a retreat yeah. after my book is officially launched. So it's like a really special Oh, it's, it's special really personal. Yeah. Yeah. How long have you been working on the book for? The book has been over two years of dedicated writing. Yeah. Like completely writing, researching, mm -hmm. um, collaborating with people. And I mean, the journey uh, of me shifting my anxiety to start owning it started in 2008. So that's been a long time. And what led you to a point where you said, this needs to become a book? Like this needs uh, to be out into the world. I, so I had gone on to do so much training yeah. in spirituality, in yoga, in um, health and nutrition. And I was sort of lucky enough that my business that I created started to do well enough that it allowed me time and money to go do these things. Earlier on, I gotta tell you, when I first got anxiety and I wanted to go do the training, I didn't have the time or the money. Yeah. Okay. So I looked into it and I was like, oh man, I can't afford it cash-wise or time-wise. Yeah. Years later, luckily, the business started to do well, so then I was able to. Yeah. And then it hit me after I had become super learned that, you know, having just been in the shoes of someone who couldn't do this a few years before that, yeah. I was like, I gotta change 
change that. Yeah. I got to make this accessible to everybody. Yeah. So that's why I wrote the book because I wanted to literally level up the playing field. Yeah. So regardless if you've got money, where you live, you've got time and autonomy, you can still get access to these tools. And that's why I wrote the yeah. book in 99 brief ways. It's so nice that, like, I think that we need to have more tools out where we're not creating that division of, well, these tools will work for you, but only if you can afford the little lemon pants. If you're drinking the kombucha, if you're drinking your green juice, and you're somewhat enlightened at that point, then then it and it's you got it. and like that. I just went to see Nadia and. Religion wasn't like the thing, but she mentioned something in a video that I watched her say and it just like it like shook me I'm like, yes, we need more people saying this. She just said, you know what? We have this. It's not just in religion We say this with like how we eat. Oh, you're not paleo enough. You're not vegan enough You're not you're not doing the yoga enough. You're not enlightened enough And it's like no yoga is about community. It's about connection We need to have all of these tools available for people yeah. So when I saw that it's like no wait like we need to write a book so that people can connect and they can learn and they can apply you don't have to come to wonderlust to get that like it's great if you're here but if you can't then exactly. then then what you exactly. know what i mean yes. and i see that from so many yes. women like we have these small little niche groups how and are you they feel the same way didn't you just love the guy i mean honestly i will also leave the link down in the description so you can go and take a go ahead and take a look at his upcoming retreat in September I believe it's coming up at the end of September if you are local within the Ontario um, area or within the Toronto area you should absolutely check it out I think the space is limited to go ahead and sign up for it and I'm sure that you will have a spectacular time I mean he is absolutely amazing now let's move right along and last but not least I almost wanted to just I wanted to leave the best for last Kind of. This is this is something very personal for me because what we discussed in um, in this what was discussed in this keynote, it, it was just really it was really moving and it really made you think and you you left feeling like oh my god thank you for finally someone speaking up about this because we need more people speaking up about this. I want you to meet, I'm going to call him Swami G because that's the short version of his name, but I will just leave the list here of his full name. His full name is Swami Jobin Dananda. I probably butchered it, but that's okay. The reason why he's so special is because during his entire talk, his entire talk was basically summed up with the core message of why in our society we are not fulfilled. He may have called it happiness, I'm calling it true fulfillment because I feel like we're sort of talking about the exact same thing, how we're chasing, we're constantly chasing based on the images and based on how our conditioning and our society is setting things up for us. And we're continuously chasing things and we're continuously being anxious and something is just missing like it's almost like a key element that is sort of missing in allowing us to be happy and allowing us to be fulfilled and grateful for the things that we have and the experiences that we have and the people that we have in our lives and the things that we have achieved you have probably gone down that same rat race so this was the essence of his entire talk turns out he actually has a youtube channel i will also leave that link down in the description so you can check him out and give your support to him he very much spoke so deeply about philosophies of life and how we can really relate those eastern teachings into our everyday life into how we can shape our lives in a way that it actually becomes more fulfilling rather than just something that we need to get through so i'm going to insert a, a quick clip here so you can take a look i didn't want to take like an hour long video for you to just kind of get a zest of it if you're interested you can go ahead and check him out on his youtube channel but my main lesson that i got out of it was it just made me realize how much i enjoy listening to uh, philosophy in general i find it so interesting because i just don't feel so out of place when 
You're speaking in general terms that can be applied to many different areas of life. And I enjoy the fact that we're using ancient philosophies that have stood this test of time. I think that's where my the draw and the attraction to ancient philosophy, to ancient teachings, ancient Eastern philosophies has just been solidified and has gotten so much stronger over the years. And so it, to me, when I saw him, when I met him, his teachings have just been ringing so true for me because I do my best to live my life from that space instead of from a place of reaction and that, you know, that jerky emotional state when you're really unsettled and really unhappy with the way things are going or with the way things are unfolding. And no matter how much you achieve, it's just some, somehow it just seems like it's never enough. So it was really eye-opening. And of course for Tony, it was a totally different experience because we're both in the same realm. We're both very like-minded, but you need to understand that I'm consumed by a lot of this. So I go a little bit deeper because I want to study this at a deeper, much deeper level because I just have such a deep interest in it. Whereas for him, he sort of takes a lot of these experiences at face value and that's not where a lot of his interests lie, which is perfectly fine. I think that we each have our own path and we honor each other exactly where we're at, which is what we should be doing anyway. So take a look. I will bring you into the clip and then I'll meet you right back here. And these two words describe the real nature of the soul. Amen. And Anand is a Sanskrit word which means bliss, joy, happiness. And you know, this energy that's minute, it's so small, it is said that if you took a strand of your hair and divided it a million times, which would be a feet, I would say, and if you could find a millionth, millionth slice of a single strand of your hair, I mean, divide one millionth slice again a million times, what you've got left, the soul is more subtle than that. You can't see it. So it is infinitesimally small, but it is anand, joyful, blissful. And this power comes to your mind. Find me the joy. Find it. Come on now. A Batman movie or a Supergirl or anything. Just ice cream dipped in chocolate with peanuts. <laughs> anything. Back massage. <laughs> Relationships, children, more the better. Come on, give it. This is your intellect saying, I'll do this, this, this. And your art that says, no, 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 no. Chocolate dipped ice cream. <laughs> no, I'm not looking for any of that periphery stuff. You are in the world, the body has a utility, no doubt about it. But when we talk about meditation, I'm not talking about give me vitality, give me youth, give me beauty, give me fame. There's meditation for that, sure. But that's got nothing to do with the art of that, nothing. So, you know, when you hear the word yoga, especially you are an educated audience, but some places in the world you say yoga, there's fear about it. <gasps> Yoga. <laughs> what does it mean? It's just a word, isn't it? Like water has got six and a half thousand names in our history. Six and a half thousand. Water is one of them. Just one of six and a half thousand names and counting. Are you going to go to war over the name of this liquid stuff? Or are you going to go in Australian? Cheers, mate. <laughs> so what I'm trying to say is if you don't know about these things, you don't invest your time in them, and you just float on the surface of your life, responding from one day to the next, responding, doing this, doing that, doing this, and never diving deep into the nature of who you are, why you are here, where you are going, why you are going, what do you want? And when the sage said, everything you do is for happiness. I go, yeah, yeah, of course it is. But not common happiness. A verse, Yovai Bhumar Tatsukam. This verse describes 
the happiness of the Atma in union with the Para Atma, the divine nature, is ever increasing. It's never overcome by death, darkness, sickness or ignorance. Is that possible? Who said that? Oh, the great personalities in our history have said that. It's couched in different language, but the meaning is there. And therefore, when you take time out to meditate on this and understand it, then you will become physically, emotionally, and mentally stronger. Okay, what did you think? Wasn't he amazing? I know he was. I know he was because I felt his energy while I was there, and then I ended up going back for the second talk that he has done, so he was just absolutely mind-blowing. I wanted to thank you guys so much for checking out this week's episode. I hope that you have enjoyed it. Let me know in the comments below who have you been inspired by the most. And in the meanwhile, just keep seeking you guys. And I hope that I was able to give you guys a chance to kind of get a nice sense of what Wonderlust is all about. And I'll see you again next week. Bye. Since I don't have my little stand, you gotta use what you gotta use. But I'm sorry, if you're right next to me and you start cackling, I'm gonna call you on it. And I think that's socially acceptable. I'm just saying. Stop cackling in a class. Cackling will get you punched out. I'm just saying. <laughs>